Hi. In this film, we're going to deal with reading pitch. And in particular, we're going to be thinking about reading pitch in the treble clef. So if you're a singer and you sing soprano or alto or even tenor, you're going to need to know about the notes in the treble clef. Or if you play an instrument that reads in the treble clef. If you're a bass singer, or you play an instrument that only ever reads in the bass clef, you may decide you want to skip this film and move on to the next one, which is going to be about reading pitch in the bass clef. Or it may be that you really need to know or want to know about both of these clefs. You're certainly going to need to know about treble and bass clef if you're a keyboard player, if you play the piano, for example. And there are a number of instruments that read in more than one clef as well. So this is going to be about the treble clef. Come back in the next film if you want to know about the bass clef. And if you're very happy already about reading the notes, then you can skip these films and move straight on to what we're going to do after. OK, let's have a think about reading pitch in the treble clef then. Now music is written on five lines. And we call the five lines of music the stave. So here comes a stave. And at the beginning of every piece of music, you should find a clef. Here's the treble clef. It's also interesting to know that the treble clef is sometimes known as the G clef. You can see how a treble clef might have started as a G and then became slightly elaborated over the years until the G turned into a treble clef. But the point of that is that the treble clef should tell us where the note G is. Can you see it's wrapped around the second line up? So it's telling us that this second line up is G. So if ever you get lost reading the treble clef, you can always be sure that it's wrapped around the second line. It's the G clef, so this line here is always G. And by the time we've worked through this, you'll see that if you know where G is, you'll be able to work out all of the other notes quite easily. So that's helpful to know. OK, we've got five lines and we've got four spaces in between the lines. Here are the spaces. One, two, three, four. So we can write notes on lines or in spaces. Let's start with the notes in the spaces. So here's the first space the second space, the third space, and the fourth space. And this works out very well because this note's F, this one is A, this one is C, and this one is E. And you'll soon see that, of course, this spells face. And face rhymes with space. So if you want to know about the notes in the spaces, Face rhymes with space, F, A, C, E. If you want to know what those notes sound like, here's F, here's A, here's C, and here's E. Just so you begin to relate these notes to sound. F, A, C, E. So that tells us about the notes in the spaces. Let's now think about the notes on the line. So here's the bottom line. You see I'm just trying to write a note that sits exactly around that bottom line. So we're very clear it's a note on a line and we're not confused about whether it's a line or a space. There's the bottom line. Here's the second line, the third line, the fourth line, and the fifth line. And these notes are E, G, B, D, and F. Now, face was quite neat, wasn't it? Because that's a word that we might recognise in English. F-A-C-E, face, rhymes with space. But what's this word? Ugerbudafer is not really a word that we know, is it? However, here's a way of remembering it. E, G, B, D, F. Every green 
bus drives fast. So every green bus drives fast. E, G, B, D, F. It's a load of nonsense because I'm sure red buses drive just as fast as green buses, but it's just a way of remembering these notes. Every green bus drives fast. So face for the spaces, every green bus drives fast for the lines. This is what these notes sound like, just so again we relate this stuff to sound. Here's the E, G, B, D, F. Let's hear that again. E, G, B, D, F. And just so you're sure that you don't ever muddle these two things up, you'll notice that there are four spaces and five lines. So F, A, C, E, four letters. So it must be space that we're dealing with. We're dealing with notes in the spaces. Every green bus drives fast. That's five words. So we must be dealing with the lines because there are five lines. So that's how you work out how to put the notes on the treble clef stave. Okay, so far so good. I'm going to rub that out now and then we're going to reorganize those notes in a slightly different way. So, here comes a new stave. Remember the stave always has five lines. So here's the stave and here is our treble clef. And I'm going to put the lines and the spaces together now because you'll notice if we just want to go one step at a time I can start on the bottom line, move up a step to the bottom space, up a step to the second line, up a step to the second space, up a step to the third line, up a step to the third space, up a step to the fourth line, up a step to the fourth space, and up a step to the fifth line. So that puts together everything we've just done. If I pick out the spaces, F, A, C, E, and then let's deal with those buses. Every green bus drives fast. You can now see that these notes, when they're put next to each other like that, actually are in alphabetical order. Now in music, as you may well know, we only use seven letters of the alphabet, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. I'm sure most people are happy about going forwards of the alphabet, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. As a musician, it's also useful to be able to go backwards quite quickly, G, F, E, D, C, B, A. And that's something actually worth practicing. Because I find lots of people can say A, B, C, D, E, F, G quite quickly, but G, F, E, D, C, B, A is a bit harder. But when music is going up, it goes forwards to the alphabet. When music comes down, it goes backwards to the alphabet. So knowing the alphabet backwards from G to A is actually quite useful. Anyway, we know that the bottom line here is E. E, up one to F, up one to G. Because G is the last letter of the musical alphabet, when we go up one again, we start again at A. Up one to B, up one to C, up one to D, up one to E, up one to F. And every time we go up to the next line or the next space, we're just going up one note. So let's see how this sounds when we put it together. And if you've got any knowledge of a keyboard at all, you'll be able to see on the screen what this looks like on a piano keyboard. Here's E. I'm now going from that line to the space next door, F. I'm now going up from that space to the next line, G. Up to the next space, A. Up to the next line, B. Up to the next space, C. Up to the next line, D. Up to the next space, E. 
up to the next line, F. So you can see on the keyboard how it's just progressing up all of these white notes one after another. E, F, G, A, B, C, D, E, F. And you begin to get used to the sound of just progressing up a step at a time from one note to the next. And of course, if you're coming backwards, coming down, it's going to go like this. F, E, D, C, B, A, G, F, E. So we can now see how all of those treble clef notes fit onto the stave. Now there are times when you might just want to extend beyond the stave, and I just want to think about that for a moment. If we're going to the alphabet A, B, C, D, E, F, well the next letter after F must be G. But we've run out of stave, haven't we? Because F was on the top line, so where's G going to go? Well you'll notice it goes line, space, line, space, line, space, line, space, line, so the next one must be in a space. And we can put it in this space just above the stave. So there is room for that G at the top. We've gone all the way to G, so that must mean that the next letter is going to be A, because we've got to go back to the start of the alphabet again. Here comes A. But where can we put A, because we really have used up the stave now? Well, if it's going line space, line space, line space, line space, line space, the next note must be on a line. There are no lines left. So what we do is we introduce a temporary extra line. And this note is going to go on that extra temporary line. Extra temporary lines are called ledger lines. Just so you know that name, if anyone talks about a ledger line, it's the extra lines above or below the stave. And once you've got ledger lines on the go, you can carry on for as long as you want to. So the next one is going to be a B. Because the A is on a line, B must be in a space. So we use the ledger line again, and we put B in the space above that ledger line. The next letter will have to be C. Well, we've used the ledger line, we've used the space above that ledger line, so this time we need two ledger lines. So Here's the A ledger line, there's the B in the space, here's the second ledger line, and C goes in that, on that second ledger line. And you can see how this works now, you could carry on. If you wanted D, that would be in the space above the second ledger line. If you wanted E, that would be on the third ledger line, so you can keep going forever. The same is also true this end, because if this note is E, well, there's a space just below E there, isn't there? And if this one is E, and we're now going down, we must be going backwards through the alphabet. When we're going up, we're going forwards through the alphabet. When we're going down, we're going backwards. So if this one is E, this must be the note before E in the alphabet, which is D. You can then see that we're going to need a ledger line. So here's a ledger line, and this note will have to be C, because C comes before D in the alphabet, doesn't it? What are we going to do for B? Well, we need the ledger line from C, and we're now going to use the space underneath that ledger line to get B. Then we're back to A. A is going to need two ledger lines, because we're still going line, space, line, space, line. And again, we can carry on. So G would be in the space below those two ledger lines. F would need a third ledger line. You can keep going forever. So hopefully that gives you an idea as to how the stave works and how we can extend the stave through the use of ledger lines. And you might begin to think, well, hang on a minute. We've got A here, we've got A here, we've got A here. So how come the same thing keeps coming round? Well, those are three A's and there are three A's in three different octaves, as we call them. So this A is this one here. This A is one octave higher, so it looks as if it's in the same place on the keyboard, but it's what we call an octave higher, eight notes higher. This A is an octave higher than that, so that's here. 
Might be easier to see that with a C's. This is C. C's on the keyboard, always on the left hand side of two black notes you can see. So this is C and we call this one middle C because it's sort of in the middle of the keyboard, in the middle of the piano. If I go up to the next C, an octave higher, there it is. If I go up to the next C on two ledger lines above the stave, it's here. So you get the idea that we might have to move from one octave to another octave. Well, we've got a huge span of notes now, haven't we? How does all this come together? Here's that A at the bottom. B, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. And that gives us the basis of how to read notes in the treble clef. And before you get on to doing some sight singing or to some sight reading, you really need to know where those notes are on the clef. One way you can actually test yourself doing this is to use your hand because abracadabra, there's a stave, one, two, three, four, five fingers, same as five lines, isn't it? First line, second line, third line, fourth line, fifth line, with the four spaces in between. So you can use your hand to test your knowledge of this by pointing at certain places. So look, I'm pointing at the bottom space, so that must be F because it's the first letter of face. Or if I point at this one, well, that's the third space, so F-A-C. It's the third letter of face, isn't it? Or if I point at this one, well, that's the bottom line. Every green bus drives fast. This must be every, so this one's E. Or if I point at this one, well, that's the fourth line up, so every green bus drives, that must be D. You can even do the space above the top line. You could even imagine that first ledger line there or this first ledger line down here. So quite useful if you have a few spare minutes just to use your hand and imagine it as the stave for a treble clef and see if you can get familiar with the notes. Then as you read a piece of music, you'll increasingly get to the point where you can think, I know that that note's A or B, whatever it happens to be. And that's a pretty important thing to be able to do if you want to sight to read or sight sing music. So while we're taking some time to get really familiar with the treble clef and how it works. So good luck with that one. And if you want to know about the bass clef instead of the treble clef or the bass clef as well as the treble clef, come back in the next film when we'll be reading pitch in the bass clef.